Hello, I greet you, and I greet you in the presence of the Most Holy Trinity, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let's keep this presence always before us, and up until the end of my, our life here on earth. And oh, today, on that moment I am going to speak, the moment we depart from here. The perfect love of God, as you know, I try to say something about having a perfect love of God in us. The perfect love of God, that's how I start, as you know. When this perfect love begins in us, by its very nature, it's something natural in it, having perfect love of God, it continues to grow until it reaches the perfect union with God in heaven. Remember that we can have a perfect union with God only in heaven. Here on earth we can't have a perfect union. We can have perfect love, but not perfect union. Because perfect love grows in its very nature. That's what I am saying. In its, in its very nature is to grow, always to grow, to grow. And then when it arrives at perfection, at the moment when God calls us, there it stops growing and that can't of course agree. And there we have perfect union with God in heaven. Now, today I would like to point out to you what some saints, there are many saints, I, I just, you know, choose some, some. You, could, you could, can choose others if you want. So I am, I am pointing out to what some saints did and said. These saints had perfect love of God in them on earth. What they did and what they said act precisely at the last moment of their lives here on earth. It's interesting because we shall arrive at that point as well. When we understand, we see and everybody would know that God is calling that person to himself for all eternity. There is no, there will be no problem about that. Sometimes when I assisted a person dying, I hear that person telling us, I'm leaving you. And a little moment after, that person departs into eternity. So it's something that we would be conscious of our departure from here. Now, let's start with St. Augustine. St. Augustine left this world while exercising perfect contrition of past sins. Remember in one of my videos, past videos, I spoke about contrition and attrition, or if you want, of perfect contrition and imperfect contrition. St. Augustine had a perfect, had perfect contrition of his sins, and uh, he had a high degree of perfect love in him. So, in his last moment, he was exercising this perfect contrition of his past sins. Saint Jerome left this world while exhorting people to the love of God and neighbor. Saint Ambrose left from here in a rapture, speaking with great love to Jesus. Shortly after, he had received Holy Communion. Saint Anthony of Padua left from here after reciting a hymn to the Blessed Virgin Mary while joyously chatting with Jesus. Saint Thomas of Aquinas left from here after joining his hands together, raised his eyes towards heaven and in a loud and zealous voice uttered the words of the Song of Songs. Come, my beloved, let's go forth in the field. From here, 
let abide in the villages. All the apostles and many of the martyrs left from here praying. Saint Bede, the Venerable, having foreknown by private revelation the time of his departure from here, it was on Ascension Day, went to church to sing Vespers and standing up without any disease at all. He left from here exactly as soon as the Vespers of the Ascension finished. He sang the glory and as soon as he finished the glory, the angels came and took his soul directly to heaven. King St. Louis, being struck with the plague, there was a plague at his time, never ceased to pray. He received the divine viaticum. When we say viaticum, it means the Holy Eucharist, he received Holy Communion, eh? the Holy Eucharist, at, at the end of your life, practically. Eh? It was the last time he received Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. So he received the divine viaticum. However, when it was time to leave from here, he spread his arms in the form of a cross on his chest, his eyes towards heaven, and with God's perfect love in him, began to say the following words, I come to your house, I will worship you in your holy temple, and I will, I will give you glory, and I will give glory to your name. Saint Eusebia, known as the stranger, left from here on her knees in prayer, in fervent prayers. Saint Francis of Assisi left from here praying to God with these words, O oh God, deliver me from the prison that I am in, so that I may praise your name forever. Saint Francis Xavier left from here with the crucifix in his hand, and with every kiss he prayed, O oh my Jesus, O oh my God, the God of my heart. Saint Bernard left from here praying to Our Lady, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for me. Saint Pius of, Pat of Petregina, eh, San Pio, Pio, of Petregina, on the last day, you know, that he died on the 23rd of September, 1968, on his last day, he made his confession and renewed the Franciscan vows. As was customary, he had the rosary beads in his hands and repeated until his last breath, Jesus, Mary, Jesus, Mary, and St. John Bosco. At the last moment of his life, he kept saying, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, Jesus, into thy hands I commend my soul. From this, we can get an idea of what we can pray while we are departing from here. Whoever has any difficulty with what I am saying can ask me. I always answer your questions as clearly as possible and according to your needs. You can also share your opinion on what I am saying. We can learn much from each other and grow in our perfect love for God together Together, we go to heaven together. You can also post the prayer you like most, even if invented by yourself. Everyone knows how to post the message on this video or on any other video of mine. Now I shall pass on to St. John Bosco. I have called today's video St. John Bosco's Prophecies to Two Women Religious. On the 28th of June, 1931, 
So we are in June, almost on the last day, 20, no, sorry, 20, 20 June, 20 June, 1931. An nun, an died at the monastery of the nuns of the Blessed Sacrament in Bassano del Grappa. So, let me explain what I have just said. First of all, I said nun, nuns of the Blessed Sacrament. They were called of the Blessed Sacrament because in their constitution, eh, in their rules, they had the duty of staying before the Blessed Sacrament day and night, all the time, of course, by turn, by turn, because they had needed to do other work as well. But they made it a point that there is always somebody day and night before the Blessed Sacrament, before Jesus. They, that's why they are called nuns of the Blessed Sacrament. And uh, these were n this, these nuns, these nuns of the Blessed Sacrament were founded by Saint Gertrude Comensoli, or if you want, Saint Gertrude Catherine Comensoli. And uh, I mentioned the monastery was in Bassano del Grappa. Now, Bassano del Grappa is a village in the province of Vicenza, in the Veneto region. So, usually we speak of Piedmont, the capital of which is Turin. Now, we go on the other side of Italy, on the east, and there is another region there, Il Veneto, Veneto, and the capital of which is Venice, Venice. Now, one of the big and beautiful cities in this region of Veneto, that is Vicenza. Vicenza is the city, is the, is the a city in, in Veneto. Now, around Vicenza, there are a number of villages, villages. And one of the villages is Bassano del Grappa, Bassano del Grappa. So, to make things clear, uh, the monastery of the nuns of the Blessed Sacrament was to be found in Bassano del Grappa, in that village, which forms part of the province of Vicenza. Now, we are speaking about a nun, a nun. We can call her a sister as well, but there is a difference. I mean, sisters live in a convent, while nuns live in a monastery. Besides, a, a sister makes three vows of uh, obedience, chastity, and uh, poverty. But they are not solemn vows, while the nuns make them in a solemn way. They are called solemn vows. Besides, nuns have a stricter rules than normal, normal sisters. Now, this was a nun. This was a nun. I am pointing out these differences on purpose. Now, this nun was called, when uh, she entered the convent, they gave her a name, Maria Ausiliatrice de San Giuseppe. And the nun was a madre when she died. She was a mother, but she died in Bassano del Grappa, in the province of Venice, eh? or in the province of Vicenza, in Bassano del Grappa. But when she entered the convent, the, mon mon the monastery, she was living in Turin. She entered first with the nuns of the Blessed Sacrament that were in Turin. Now, the nun was madre, superior. She was very frail. She was very frail, I mean, weak in her, you know, physique. She was weak, so much so that if you were to see her, you say, well, I don't think you are go 
si uta bin to become a nun, to become a sister, all right. Okay, but to become a nun with the strict rule, it's a bit hard for you. Now, however, she was admitted to the novitiate of the nuns of the Blessed Sacrament in Turin in 1880, 1880. Why? Simply because when she spoke to St. John Bosco, who encouraged her to enter that monastery, Don Bosco told her to enter because she would be able to survive monastic life with its strict rules. And St. John Bosco, she was still in the world, she hadn't entered yet, but of course she intended to enter especially after the encouragement she received from St. John Bosco. And before she left, Don Bosco gave her a medal. And the medal had two images. On one side, it had the image of Maria Auxiliatrice, Mary Help of Christians. And on the other side, it had the image of St. Joseph, San Giuseppe. So that is important to notice, please. And um, this nun, now we can call her Maria Auxiliatrice di San Giuseppe, this nun did not tell anyone about her visit to St. John Bosco and what Don Bosco told her, I mean, that he encouraged her to enter the monastery and that he gave her also that medal with those two images. No, nobody knew about that. Her superior, when she entered, of course, after the novitiate and so on, and they had to, she had to take a new name, not the one she had at birth, but a new one at her, so to say, entrance in the monastery. They take new names. The superior gave her the name of Monaca, Monaca Nun, Nun, not Sister Nun, Monaca. In Italian, Suora would be Sister, but Monaca in this case. Monaca, but what was the name? Maria Auxiliatrice de San Giuseppe. How come? Don Bosco, before she entered, gave her a medal with Maria Auxiliatrice and San Giuseppe on both sides. And the name that she was given when she entered the monastery, nobody knew anything, was Monaca, Maria Auxiliatrice de San Giuseppe. But this, this is not the end of the story. St. John Bosco, when she went to speak to him before she entered the monastery, announced to her the following. He told her that after many years, a number of monast monastic nuns of Veneto, she entered in the monastery of Turin. But Don Bosco was telling her that in the Veneto region there would be a number of monastic nuns belonging to some other monastery. They will join the some nuns of the Blessed Sacrament. And you, this nun, was speaking to St. John Bosco, you will set up a new monastery there in the Veneto region. And uh, there, he told her, Don Bosco, there you will greatly be sanctified and prepared well for heaven. And you will die at the age I will have when I die myself. This was in 1880. St. John Bosco died in 1888, eight years after. All right? And uh, so everything he told her happened after St. John Bosco had already passed away into eternity. As a matter of fact, the nun was sent in 1901, so Don Bosco was already in heaven. It, the nun Maria Auxiliatrice de San Giuseppe, in 1901, she was sent to establish the monastery 
of those foreign nuns, so to say, and uh, nuns of the Blessed Sacrament together, and all of them began, became uh, nuns of the Blessed Sacrament. And uh, she was sent to, the, to, to set up the monastery in Bassano del Grappa. That, that's why I started with the nun died in Bassano del Grappa, eh, in that monastery. And she, there, she was there in the Veneto origin, without revealing the prophecy of St. John Bosco. In 1916, she was elected superior, and then she was re-elected superior for the second time. As a superior, she also had a holy life, but then became seriously ill. Once, when she, wa when she was ill, she asked a nun that was there with her about Don Bosco's age when he died, when he left here into eternity. This nun did not know there and then, but later on she succeeded to get the information and told Madre Maria Ausiliatrice di San Giuseppe that he was 72 years old when he died. There and then Maria Ausiliatrice di San Giuseppe narrated to the other nun whatever happened between her and St. John Bosco. And precisely on the 20th June, as I started the narration here, on the 20th June, 1931, when she was 72 years old, she passed away into eternity. That is, at the same age Don Bosco had when he left here for eternity. Now I pass on to another prophecy. St. John Bosco told to another sister, now this time is not a nun, a sister, a sister, and he told her the future of her mission. This time we are speaking of Sister Brambilla, Brambilla her surname, Brambilla, Sister Brambilla, her surname, she was Italian of course as well. This was a Sister of Charity. Now when we say Sister of Charity, there is a range of congregations, Sisters of Charity, basically and most probably they are somehow derived from Daughters of Charity of Saint Vincent, Vincent de Paul, eh? Les Filles de la Charité. But then they changed their names a bit. Some are called Ancille, Servants of Charity, others Sisters of Charity of Saint, uh, Saint Antide, for, for instance, uh, Saint John Antide, others perhaps other types, but there are the, we don't, I don't have the exact name of the congregation of the of this sister of this uh, uh, sister Brambilla. I just found she was a sister of charity, and um, most probably she was sister of uh, charity of Saint John Antide. Uh, in Italy, there are many convents of, of these of these nuns and they have the uh, mother house uh, near in Rome near the Tiber there is the Bocca della Verità eh? the Mount of Truth in uh, Santa Maria and Cosmedin and uh, so so we take her to be just Sister Brambilla a sister of charity so, the Sister of Charity wore her religious habit, you know, that after some time, after the novitiate and so on, they wear, they still do it, of course, they wear their, their habit, eh, according to the congregation they are in. And uh, she wore her religious habit for the first time on the 4th of September, 1880, 1880, 4th September, in the city of Turin. She was sent then by her superior to the girls' orphanage in the city of Sassari. 
So from Turin, she was sent to Sassari. Now Sassari is in Sardinia. The capital city of Sardinia is Cagliari, but it is at the, you know, bottom, so to say, of Sardinia, while Sassari is on the top, on the top. Both are, Cagliari is the capital city, Sassari, it's a big city, beautiful city, but uh, it's not the capital city. And uh, she was sent there to a girl's orphanage, orphanage, in the city of Sassari. And she was sent to Sardinia with two other sisters. The other sisters were old and she was still young. So they were three sisters, sisters of charity. Sister Brambilla told the story of what happened herself. So, so Sister Brambilla is narrating and she said, we, the three sisters, we left Turin on the 11th of September, 1880. 11th September, 1880. So we went to Turin station, the train station, got on the train that was going to Livorno because they intended then that Livorno, from Livorno, they board the ship to Sassari. And we boarded so the train and found our place in our of the train compartments, which was assigned to us. The other nuns put their luggage on a high shelf. You know that in compartments in train, above the heads, there is a shelf where one can put the luggage. But Sister Brambilla did not want to put her luggage up there. She had her name on the luggage and she pressed, her, pressed it under her seat in such a way that no one could see it. She didn't say, say why, but you know, she had that character at least. Yes, so she put her, her, her luggage under her seat. A few minutes later, two people boarded the train, a man and a priest. They got on the train and came in the same compartment of ours. So now in this compartment where six people could stay, you had three nuns on one side and two men, or better a man and a priest, in front, in the same compartment. They sat down in front of us. The train started moving and no one in the compartment uttered a word. They just stayed, I don't know, looking at each other, looking outside from the window. The train arrived at its first stop, at its first station. It was Asti. Sometimes we mentioned in other videos Asti. Asti is a big and beautiful city in, uh, in the region of Piedmont, at Piedmont. And it is part of the Monferrato. And the other part is Alessandria. So the train from Turin arrived at, us, at Asti and stopped so that people could either get off the train or get uh, or on the train. Yes. And uh, as we arrived in Asti, the priest that was, the, remember that Sister Brambilla is narrating, the priest who was in front of us stood up and looked out of the window. Many people approached the open window of the train where the priest was and with great joy began to greet him and started wishing him a good day. Good morning, good morning, in Italian, buongiorno, buongiorno. They also began to shake hands with him, always wishing him a good day. Sister Brambilla, I, it means so, she is speaking, I fixed my eyes on that priest and realized that the priest was Don Bosco who did so much good with the young and that those people, you, who were outside of the train were his youths. I can't tell you how happy I was when I saw him because I was convinced that he was a holy priest. But since I knew that he worked with young people 
and that he had a great influence on them. And at the same time, I had never seen him or met him before. I imagined him that Don Bosco was a tall man, well built, with an imposing Im appearance, while I noticed that he was a priest with nothing extraordinary in him, and I imagined him also to have big ears. These were my thoughts. Sister Brambilla is thinking while looking at Don Bosco. These were my thoughts, thoughts on Don Bosco, that I was saying to myself only, but I didn't say anything to anybody in the train compartment. It was time then for the train to leave, to leave Asti and continue on its way. Don Bosco greeted the young men outside of the train and sat, sat down near his friend who was with him, with us and the, the three sisters in front of them. So they continued in the same way. Three sisters on one side of the compartment and Don Bosco and that man in front. Suddenly Don Bosco looked at his friend and said in a voice loud enough so that I could hear him. Remember Sister Brambilla is narrating. So that I could hear him. And Don Bosco was saying, once a photographer took a photo of me and then he gave me six small copies of my photo. I stared at them and I noticed how I looked from the outside and I was quite shocked because I thought I was tall, well built, with an imposing appearance and had big ears. As I Sister Brambilla, as I heard these words, which were the very thoughts of my mind, I started blushing. Don Bosco knew well that those words which he had just said about himself were my thoughts, my thoughts on him. Without having expressed, of course, these thoughts to anyone. As a matter of fact, his friend and the other sisters knew nothing. They knew nothing about her thoughts. Therefore, when he saw that I was embarrassed, Don Bosco, to distract me from what I was thinking, started a conversation with me. And he asked me, Sister, where are you going? And I, reply, I replied, Sardinia. And Don Bosco asked again, and what will you do in Sardinia? And I replied, I am going to work in a girl's orphanage. And here Don Bosco asked me, would you like to go and work with boys instead of girls? Don't you like it? You can do a lot of good with naughty boys. One of the other sisters who were with me told him, send your priest to work with naughty boys. Let your priest do good to these boys. And then Don Bosco, shaking his head, told her, Sardinia doesn't seem to be for us at the moment. Now we shall see. Perhaps God will send some priest in the future. Meanwhile, the train arrived at San Pienderena station Don Bosco and his friend wanted to get off the train at the station. After they went down, Don Bosco greeted us, the three sisters, from outside the train. And then he said to me in a loud voice, Sister Brambilla, work hard with the boys. We remained on the train. When we arrived in Livorno, we went down and we were greeted by some of the sisters of our congregation. Of course, we intended to go to the port to board the ship. The ship from Livorno to Sardinia, to Sassari. But as we were chatting with the sisters, one of them gave me a letter. In this letter, written by my superior, 
we, the three sisters, were told not to go to the girls' orphanage in Sassari, but to the boys' hospice. Here I understood more why Don Bosco insisted on my going to work with boys and not with girls when he greeted us again as he got off the train in San Pierre de Red Arena. The Sassari Boys' Hospice was a very poor home. There were 50 orphans in it who needed badly to be cared for, taught and educated. There were already five sisters taking care of them, two of whom in six months' time passed away into eternity. St. John Bosco prophesied to me and to us what God's will was for us and prepared us in advance to accept God's will for us, even though that was not what we wanted. You who are listening and me, one day in heaven together shall be, always by the power of God's grace.